You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rama Power, with Reverend Nee Benadadiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6:15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7:30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9:45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Manna, a weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6:30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God in Jesus' name. God richly bless you. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse four. Second Corinthians chapter six. I'm still trying to help you characterize and identify men of God and what they do. So look at Second Corinthians chapter six, verse four, and then verse ten. So Paul is talking about how men of God behave, okay? And in verse ten, he talks about some of the things they do. So look at what he says. One to go. He says, "But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God." He says, "We are doing everything to make us show that we are approved of God, and to let people understand that we are not just pursuing our own selfish ambitions." And desires. So, in all things, approving ourselves, we place a demand on ourselves. What are the things we do? He says, in much patience, patience, and then he says, in affliction, and he says, in necessities, and the Bible says the last thing, in distresses. Uh huh. So, do I go through it? Of course. But these are not the things that qualify me. What I carry in my mouth is the word. So if you look at natural things, he may be your classmate. You are better than him. You wear nicer clothes. You have more money. You are going through life. Life seems to be easier. But Paul says, in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And how do we do it? In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. And you will find out as I begin to show you practical examples of Elijah, Elisha, Jesus Christ, all of them. That they all went through these things. In fact, Paul, at a certain point, the great apostle Paul was being persecuted so much that he jumped through a window, and somebody put him in a basket and let him out because people were against his life. Didn't he have personal security? Couldn't he just pray and call angels to come and fight for him? But sometimes we go through all these things. May God open our eyes so to begin to discern and to receive this man. Verse ten. Look at verse ten. It says, "As sorrowful, Eish. they also go through pain." When a man of God is going through sorrows, where does he go? As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So, in the midst of our sorrows, we are still here smiling. We don't make our sorrows <laughs> the ministry. What I like is, as poor, yet making many rich. One of the things about a man of God is that he strips himself to make many people rich. So, when you sit under the calling of a man of God, you become better. You become richer. We make many rich. You see, by the sacrifices we offer, we help people to become better and richer. We bail people out of jail. <laughs> we pay school fees for people. We help people start businesses. We we don't take the money to start our own businesses, but we help people. We are still making ourselves poor and making people rich by the teachings we teach, by the word of God we preach, by the prophecy we pronounce on people. We make many rich, and he says, as having nothing and yet possessing. All things. So you will find out that in some of the churches, when it's time to appreciate the pastor, it's on another level because they even realize that no matter what we give to him, the more we give to him, the more we are blessed. The more we appreciate the gift that God has sent, and the more we receive it. As many as received him, to them, God all of a sudden gives them power to become. So they were not, but they received him, and then they also received the power to change their lives. What changes the, or what breaks the back? 
a negative side job. It's your ability to receive the man of God. That's why I read John chapter 1. He was in the world. The world knew him not. He came unto his own. His own knew not. That's one of the saddest stories about Israel. That the presence of God was with them to do so much. The great and mighty God. To do so much for them. Yet they couldn't receive him. Turn your Bible with me quickly to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 from verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Verse 2. And he lift up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself unto the ground. Who are we talking about? Abraham. Abraham is one person who speaks with God directly. He's a great man by all standards. And yet, Abraham recognizes men of God. He has a relationship with Melchizedek. And yet, he's also looking at the relationship with these men. These are men sent on a divine assignment to Sodom and Gomorrah by God himself to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They don't know Abraham and Abraham doesn't know them. Yet, Abraham sees them and sees something beyond three mere men. And the Bible says that he ran to meet them from the tent door and he bowed himself toward the ground. I mean, you are Abraham. You are the richest man on earth. You have the most beautiful wife on earth. You have everything you need on this earth. You don't need these three men who are stragglers walking through your town. But God opens Abraham's eyes and Abraham sees something that a lot of people don't see. So the Bible says that Abraham is a rich man. He ran. He didn't even sit down and say, I mean, if you're a rich man in your house and you see people coming, okay, let them come. But Abraham gets up, runs to meet them. And what does he do? He bowed himself to the ground. What does Abraham see that you don't see? Why should Abraham, the rich man, recognize anybody? Why should Abraham bother himself? Verse 3. And said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you. Look at the language of Abraham. Talking to three men who seem to be strangers who are visiting his town. He says, and let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your heart. After that, you shall pass on, for this is why you are come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. I mean, the whole encounter is a bit surrealistic. This is Abraham we are talking about. He has met Melchizedek. The guy has met senior, and yet he meets another group of three men who are tired. So you see, the people got sent tired in necessity. They want food. They want water. And they've come to Abraham's town. And Abraham is sitting down. Rich man. Everybody knows him. And yet he rises up and he runs towards them. And he bows down and he begins to talk to them like a small boy. Wow. Verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tent. You see, I like the verbs that have been run. Hastened. It's not somebody who is just walking around giving orders. He runs himself. He hastens. I mean, can you meet a man of God? Can you? Can you run? Can you hasten? Sometimes you see somebody who is an ambassador. And yet he, he meets a man of God and all of a sudden he, he sees himself as small. Because there are encounters you must respect. I know that when you see an ambassador kneeling down, you may think, oh, he's been jinxed. And I know that that's what the world thinks. When you start coming to church and you start doing things, people will start insulting you. Because it's as if you are following a man, you are worshipping a man, you have nothing to do. But I can see Abraham hastening, running, going to his wife and say, the wife hasn't planned to cook, but he says, you must cook. Why? Because I've met some people, I believe they're on a divine assignment. Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the head. Seven. And Abraham ran unto the head, fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it to a young man. And he hasted. He hasted to dress it. Wow. Verse eight. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Whilst they were eating, where was Abraham? Standing by them. He's not sitting down. He's not relaxed. He's willing to serve them. These are people on divine assignment. God has sent them. They didn't have anything to do with Abraham. But Abraham intercepted them. Verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold in the tent. So the guys would have passed by. Sarah would have stayed there. Abraham would have stayed in his house. But all of a sudden, by Abraham's gesture of hospitality, he arrested them. And all of a sudden, they asked, Where is your wife? Abraham never went and said, Come and do something with my wife. Abraham didn't go because he had a need. He first ministered. These are secrets you must learn. Oh, he first ministered. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Verse 16. And the men rose up from thence 
and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. These were men on assignment to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But their mission was intercepted and delayed by Abraham. Hey! Let's look at another example. 2 Kings chapter 4. The story of Elisha with the Shunammite woman. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8. And it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where there was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. What is the characteristic of the woman? Great woman. Not an ordinary person. Great woman. What happened? And she constrained him to eat bread. What happened? She constrained him. What does it mean to constrain? It means that Elisha was not ready to go. But what did the woman do? Persistently, consistently, urging, forcing. And now, today's message. Look at verse 9, 2 Kings chapter 4. Verse 9. This is another thing about verse 9. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive. You see, she didn't just now look. Perceiving is a deeper revelation. I encountered him as maybe a pastor or someone who is doing the work of God. But after watching him, I now perceive that this is a man of God. He's not just an ordinary person. After having been around him and having ministered to him for a while, I've seen something about him that is different. That he's not just an ordinary person. He's a man on divine assignment. I perceive that this is an holy man of God which passes by us continually. What was the first reaction? Verse 10. Let us make a little chamber. Now it's no longer just food. It's no longer just food. Let us make a little chamber. I pray thee on the wall and let us set him there a bed. And a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be that whenever he cometh to us, that he shall no longer just eat here, but he shall sleep and turn in either. He will stay in our house. You want to talk about the blessing of Obedidom? Carrying the presence of God into your home. Not just passing by your house, but now he stays in your house. So you see why she constrained him. Then her thinking shifted to another level. Let us make him a little chamber. You see how it's different from the world? Eh, you don't have anything to do with your money. You are building a pastor house. Are you are taking an offering to buy him a car? Are you stupid? Are you fools? You want your house to be filled? You want Jesus to come into your house and abide like Zacchaeus? Because when we step into your house, we leave something there. When we step into your house, our footprints leave something there. We're not ordinary. But it starts with you understanding a high appreciation that this is a man of God. He's not an ordinary man. She said, I perceive that this guy, and so let me shift and increase my ministration to him. There are some people who have never, and they don't think the pastor deserves even a bottle of water. It is not the fact that you are not in church, you are not praying, but there's a dimension of God that is missing in your life because you haven't learned how to provoke the blessing by the secret of receiving a man of God. And I know, I told you, as for these secrets and things, when you share them, sometimes like you are casting your pearls before swine or you are giving holy things to dogs, there will always be criticisms. And today when, when pastor was preaching about ministering to men of God, because I'm sure he wants some bread in the house, you see? And that is why these things, secrets, are not usually told publicly. Secrets are told to people in a relationship. And you find out that because you have a secret, it gives you an advantage. It's like tithing. It's something that is meant to help you. But look at the negative. So now we don't ask anybody to pay tithe. These are things that have helped me. Oh yeah. Just a divine encounter. This woman didn't have a child. Look at it. Verse 11. And it came to pass on a day that he came hither and he turned into the chamber and he lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, call this woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto her, say now unto her, behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Do you want me to speak to the king or to the captain of the host? And she said, I dwell amongst my people. I am quite influential in my own circles. I know my people, they will do a lot for me. In verse 14, and he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she has no child and her husband is old. You see, this is a very polite way of describing possible situation. Verse 15, and he said, call her. Kai. You see, the man of God is now sitting up no longer as an ordinary Elijah, no longer as Jacob, but he strengthened himself, Israel. He said, call her. You see, work your way into a position where when you have been asked, <laughs> call her. 
I want to bless this woman who has saved me all these years. I want to bless this young man who has been faithful and worked around me all these years. I want to satisfy and pour out something divine over your life. That money can buy, education can buy, the world can give you. I want to bring something from the supernatural into your life. But you see, it's going to take you first learning how to receive. Because initially, it looked like Elisha was the one in need. He was in necessity. He was in distress. He didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Oh, so my pastor doesn't have a house. My pastor doesn't have a car. My pastor is hustling. You see, at a certain point, you look as if you are helping him. But there is a benefit. See, Paul says that my God shall supply all your needs. My God. And they're all serving the same God. But there's a dimension of God that is provoked when you learn to minister to Paul. And this is one of the missing links in a lot of people's lives. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a chicken gathers head and you didn't allow me? And every time I sent a prophet, you stoned him. You killed him. You rejected him. You fought him. And he says, he that receiveth you, receiveth me. You see, I see good people who are still desolate because they haven't learned to be around a man of God because he's valuable. He begins to make many rich. He begins to make your desolate cities inhabited. Things that you couldn't do that were barren, all of a sudden they begin to flourish because you received a messenger of God. And as many as received him, to them, look at verse 15. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door and he said, about this season, according to this time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. <laughs> because she was old. The husband was old. And the woman conceived, verse 17, and bear a son at the season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. This is a notable woman. The remarkable relationship between Elisha and the Shunammite woman began when the woman initiated to do something for the prophet without the prophet asking. She initiated it. She initiated it. You see, initiate something. First Kings chapter 17. This is the story of Elijah with the widow. And Elijah looks like someone who himself is fleeing from poverty. Elijah is in a precarious situation. He's caught in divine judgment against Ahab. That involves a severe drought over the face of the land and a famine which is affecting everybody. He's hiding from the wrath of Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah is said to go to an area far away, removed from the capital of Samaria called Wadi Cherith. In this desolate place, God provides for Elijah by sending ravens to bring food. Elijah is then forth being fed until the wadi or the river, which has been providing Elijah with much needed water, also runs dry. And once more, God's provision for Elijah continues. God is going to show us something. He sends the prophet to a widow in Zarephath, a town between Tyre and Sidon. Again, you see, this whole scenario seems to be an unlikely scenario or choice for mediating God's provision. Not only is Zarephath a Canaanite city in the outskirts of the land, but God is sending him to a widow. Is it not typically widows who should be helped? Nevertheless, with very few options available, Elijah complies only to find that the widow is not a viable option for survival. But some way, somehow, appealing to the laws of hospitality, according to which a stranger was entitled to food and drink, Elijah asked the widow he encounters for a drink of water and a bite to eat. So look at verse 7. And it came to pass after a while, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. I have done what? Commanded. So long before Elijah went, God had spoken to the woman and said, I'm bringing you somebody to feed. Forgive me, does it make sense? That of all the people in that city, the person God should go and talk to and command is a widow who is broke doesn't make sense because God takes the foolish things of this world so the widow who is struggling like many people you are struggling in life you don't have enough and then you are the person who is going to rather feed the pastor ah! pastor then you see how the talk starts God is about to do something and break something over your life your house that was desolate is going to flourish but look at the attitude God comes they can't receive him because he comes in necessities and distress. He comes like somebody who's in need, but he's ministering. God help us to move to the next stage of our lives, to be able to cross the threshold and get to the next level. I've commanded a window woman to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. 
And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. This miracle required the widow's obedience to God's principle that there's a man sent from God. Even in our dire need to break the back of farming and stop begging and stop the dependency syndrome, you have to learn how to receive a man of God and minister to him. You will not die. You will not be broke again. So in verse 12, and she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. That we may eat it and die. This woman started, as the Lord thy God liveth. I believe that she was a Christian going to church. She knew the Lord thy God, but she was going to die. And what a terrible way to die. Die out of hunger. Die out of lack. Die because you don't have enough money to pay hospital. Die because you don't have enough money to buy food. Die because you couldn't buy good water. Die because everything around you, you couldn't afford. And yet, she was in church. Her house was desolate until God sent her the solution. Why didn't God go to her herself and answer her prayer? Don't you think this woman was praying to God? But God's principles cannot be flouted. So God said, even though you've been praying, I'm going to send a solution. I'm going to send you an answer. What's the answer? I'm sending you a man of God. And if you can unlock that mystery, it will change your life. So Elijah appears, looks at the woman and says, Charlie, bring me something to eat. And as you are going, Charlie, make some cake too. Hey, the man of God has come. And the woman said, Charlie, I have only this thing for me and my son. And we are going to eat it and die. That's our last meal. And look at verse 13. Look at what Elijah did. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. I speak to somebody and I tell you, fear not. Fear not, but do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first. And bring it unto me. And after for thee and thy son. Put me before yourself and your son. Now, how many people can receive these instructions? Put me before yourself and your son. Put me before yourself and your family. Put me before yourself and your needs. Value. Somebody say value. 14. For thus saith the Lord. <laughs> the barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail. Until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Okay. Verse 15. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. So, your last meal. I can imagine the woman. While she's doing it, she's thinking about her son. The son is sitting down. Ma, is that all we are going to eat today? And the mother can't tell the son, this is not for you. Even though I'm preparing it, I'm not giving you some. Even what I'm preparing is not enough just for us. But we are going to divide it and go and give something first to this man of God before we think about ourselves. And I can imagine the son is hungry. Ma, come on, hear me. Whilst the food is being prepared, Ma, it's not enough. And then the mother takes it away and then sends it to Elijah. The tears, they that sow in tears. The foolishness of God. And look at what the Bible says. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house, she and he and her house did it many days. They were going to die the next day. But a savior had come into the house. Somebody had done something to change and save many people. The rest of the people will have died. But one singular act by one woman of faith was going to bring salvation and life. How many people are saved because of your obedience? You see, that is what the world cannot see. That is what sometimes you even cannot see. How many people are saved just by your obedience? That's the frightening part. What we cannot see, but God does. How many people are saved by your first fruits? How many people are saved by your tithing? How many people are saved by your prayer? How many people are saved by your obedience? You can't tell. But the Bible tells us, she and he and her house did it many days. Poverty had been broken. All of a sudden, she was being made rich. Somebody who was broke, didn't have anything, was the ridicule of people. She didn't have a husband. She didn't have people working around and supporting her. All of a sudden, she did it many days. Many days. Verse 16. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. God didn't speak himself. He puts the word in Elijah's mouth to speak to the people. What is interesting, the widow reveals that in this desperate time, she has very little resources. Instead of food being the source of life, the widow's desperation is evident in the assertion that she and her son will eat their last meal and then they will die. 
in the absence of food, the only logical conclusion is that death will soon follow. But God was sending Elijah to turn her away from bread alone into an encounter with the bread of life that never runs dry. From this text, it is evident that the fate of Elijah and the widow is intrinsically linked. By helping Elijah, the widow is helping herself and her son. By helping Elijah, the widow is helping herself and her son and her family. You see, that's the revelation. By helping the man of God, you are helping yourself and your family and your future. You see what it looks like? It's foolish to give to a man of God, isn't it? But what are you doing? You are helping yourself, your family, and your future. Because of that, she didn't die. Because of that, there wasn't a waste of resources on funeral and expenses. Because of that, there wasn't a waste on hospital bills. She helped herself. She helped the child. She helped her household. All of a sudden, somebody who was so dependent broke that dependency syndrome. Every time you give to a man of God, you may not directly see it. Because the Shunammite woman was saved in her future by the word which Elisha spoke. The blessing is not just for today. Yes, we know what to do. We prolong our life. We bring fulfillment into our house. We cause our house to flourish because we give to a man of God. If you are a widow, listen, this is the time for you to break the back of something that has been harassing you for a long while. This is the time to break the back of desolation in your family and over your life because we make many rich. We are going through afflictions. <laughs> we go through necessities. We are walking through. We don't ask. But if you can intercept what God is doing, and bring us into your home and into your life, something will change. Some of you, for the first level of contact, it's a level of salvation. Just by meeting me, just by coming to a church like this, a lot of things have just straightened up. It's just the first level of personal salvation. But there are other levels of provision. You see, the first level is a level of, I preach the word of God to you, you become a good person, you become a good wife, you become a good husband, things are working well for you, but that's just the primary level. There's another level of provision, and then there's a level of protection. And it all comes through the agency of a messenger of God. Why was Abraham able to go to war and defeat five kings? Because Melchizedek said, Charlie, it was the Lord who gave you the victory. Because if the Lord hadn't fought for you, the guys would have killed you. All of a sudden, Abraham said, I'm giving you tithe. You see, he ministered. Don't let the devil confuse you. God is a good God. God is a good God. God is a good God. And there are things he shows us so that our future will be better. And I pray for all of you that God give you the grace to be able to discern and to do it. I have learned just by experience that God will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. We trust in God. He's a good God. God fed Elijah with ravens. It was the woman who needed help. That is why God sent Elijah to her. It wasn't that God couldn't feed Elijah. God can and will feed Elijah even with birds of the air. But because the woman needed help, God allowed Elijah to go to the woman. It was the woman who needed help, not Elijah. And so it is important for all of you. Let's begin to understand mysteries. That will give us an advantage in life. All of a sudden, your family, you are going to shoot out. All of a sudden, your community, things are going to work well. They thought you were nothing. They thought you were a widow about to die. But suddenly, you are the person who's providing bread for your household. Because you found something that is hidden from a lot of people. It's called you've encountered the mystery of a man of God. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, our weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m., to pray and seek his faith for divine encounters. The king has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Thank you. 
for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Me Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power. Shine up